46 years ago today, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald sank in Lake Superior. All 29 crew members aboard died. On November 10, 1975, the largest ship on the Great Lakes, the Edmund Fitzgerald, sailed into oblivion. This area was just notorious to eating ships and big storms. The freighter and its 29 crew members vanished without a single distress call. The accepted theory has always been that monstrous 35-foot waves snapped the colossal ship in half. But what many overlooked is that this theory might be completely wrong. An unprecedented acoustic scan of the wreck has just been completed and the findings are stunning. The data shows something happened to the Fitzgerald that defies all previous explanations. We are about to show you what they found. The Titan and the Tempest. The SS Edmund Fitzgerald was more than just a ship, it was a legend in its own time. Launched in 1958, it was the largest freighter ever to sail the Great Lakes, a 729-foot giant known as the Queen of the Lakes. For 17 years, it was the workhorse of the region, hauling massive loads of taconite iron ore from the mines of Minnesota to the steel mills near Detroit. The thing nobody tells you is that these ships operate on an unbelievably tight schedule, and the Fitzgerald was known for its speed and reliability, often breaking its own cargo records. It was a symbol of American industrial might, a titan of the freshwater seas. Many people are crazy about the sheer scale of this vessel. If you stood it on its end, it would be taller than a 70-story skyscraper. On November 9, 1975, the Fitzgerald was loaded with over 26,000 tons of iron ore pellets. It left port under the command of Captain Ernest McSorley, a veteran skipper with over 40 years of experience. The weather forecast was for a typical November gale, nothing a ship of this size hadn't handled before. But you see, the Great Lakes are a different kind of beast. Their relatively shallow depths can whip up steep, vicious waves in a hurry. What many overlooked is that this wasn't a typical gale. This was a November witch, a storm of historic proportions. By the next day, the situation had deteriorated rapidly. The winds were screaming at over 50 miles per hour, with gusts hitting nearly 90. The waves, which the captain of a nearby ship called Unbelievable, were swelling to heights of 35 feet. These weren't just ocean-style rollers, they were chaotic, pyramid-like walls of water crashing down from all directions. In the afternoon, Captain McSorley radioed another ship, the Arthur M. Anderson, reporting that his vessel had a list and had lost two vent covers and a railing. The most shocking fact is that his radars were also out, meaning he was sailing blind in the hurricane-force winds and snow. The last communication from the Fitzgerald came at around 7.10 p.m. The Anderson radioed to ask how they were doing. Captain McSorley's final words were hauntingly calm. We are holding our own. Ten minutes later, the ship vanished from the Anderson's radar. There was no distress call, no sign of a struggle. One moment, a 729-foot behemoth was there. The next, it was gone. The entire crew of 29 men, fathers, sons, and brothers, was lost to the icy depths of Lake Superior. To put it mildly, the disappearance was as sudden as it was absolute. For decades, the question of what exactly happened in those final 10 minutes has fueled endless debate. But now the mystery has been blown wide open. A research vessel equipped with a new generation of multi-beam acoustic profilers recently returned to the wreck site. This technology is 100 times more sensitive than the side-scan sonars used in the past. It doesn't just paint a blurry picture, it creates a three-dimensional, high-definition model of the wreck with inch-perfect accuracy. What the science team saw in the initial data was so bizarre, it sent a ripple of disbelief through the entire crew. They saw something that no one had ever seen before. 50 years of silence. The search for the Edmund Fitzgerald began almost immediately, but the ferocity of the storm made it impossible. Days later, when the waters calmed, debris started to appear, but the ship itself was gone. It wasn't until the following spring, in 1976, that an underwater survey located the wreck. There it was, 530 feet down in Canadian waters, the magnificent ship was in two large pieces lying close together on the lake bed in a heap of mangled steel. Over the years, several expeditions have visited the site. The most famous was in 1989 when Jacques Cousteau's team filmed the wreck with a remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. The footage they brought back was ghostly. The bow section was upright, seemingly plowing into the mud with its name, Edmund Fitzgerald, still visible. 
The stern section was upside down, the propellers caked in silt. What these early explorations confirmed was that the ship had suffered a catastrophic failure. But how? And you can see this everywhere in the debates. The theories are all over the map. One popular theory is that the ship bottomed out on the Six Fathom Shoal, a shallow, rocky area. The idea is that the vessel scraped the bottom, ripping a gash in its hull that allowed water to pour in, slowly pulling the bow down until it nosedived. Another theory, and the one the Coast Guard leaned toward, is that massive waves washed over the deck, forcing water into the cargo hold through the damaged vent covers. This would have weighed the front of the ship down, causing it to plunge into a giant wave and never resurface. And then there's the most dramatic theory, the Three Sisters. This maritime legend speaks of three massive rogue waves that can form in quick succession. The idea is that the first two waves lifted the bow and stern, leaving the middle of the ship suspended in air with no support. The immense weight of the cargo would have then snapped the keel, breaking the ship's back in an instant. For 50 years, the leading explanations have been etched in maritime history, repeated in documentaries and textbooks as fact. But the new acoustic mapping data doesn't just challenge those theories. The thing nobody tells you is that older sonar systems were like painting with a blunt instrument. They could only give you a rough, ghostly outline of the vessel on the seabed. They couldn't detect the fine, web-like stress fractures or the subtle, fatal warping of the steel hull. This new acoustic profiler, however, operates on a forensic level. It bombards the wreck with millions of sound pulses from every conceivable angle, building a perfect digital twin of the ship. The model is so detailed that engineers can now analyze the metal fatigue and structural integrity as if they were holding a piece of the wreckage in their own hands. The most shocking fact is what this new data revealed about the vessel's final moments. It wasn't a clean snap, as the convenient rogue wave theory has long suggested. It also wasn't a simple nosedive from taking on too much water. The acoustic model showed thousands of microfractures running along the ship's keel, damning evidence of extreme progressive metal fatigue that nobody knew about. The data suggests it was crushed before it ever hit the bottom. The final horrifying truth. The team of maritime engineers and data analysts who studied the new acoustic model were collectively stumped. They stared at the complex 3D renderings on the screen, a ghostly digital twin of the wreck lying in the cold, dark depths of Lake Superior. For decades, the sinking of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald had been a puzzle wrapped in an enigma, a maritime ghost story whispered by sailors and immortalized in song. Theories range from massive rogue waves swallowing the ship whole to the vessel scraping a shallow shoal tearing its hull open. But this new evidence didn't fit any of the existing theories perfectly. It painted a picture far more complex and violent. It was clear that the ship had perished due to a devastating combination of factors, but the central event, the breakup itself, was far more violent and strange than anyone had imagined. The breakthrough came from a next-generation acoustic profiler, a device that could penetrate the silt and mud of the lake bed and map not just the ship's shape, but the very stress patterns and molecular damage within its steel plates. What many overlooked in the past, or simply couldn't see, was the grim possibility that the ship's structural integrity was already critically compromised long before the storm's final devastating blow. The thousands of microfractures shown by the acoustic profiler were like cracks in an eggshell, invisible to the naked eye but representing a catastrophic weakness, just waiting for the right amount of pressure to shatter. The grand old ship, a workhorse of the Great Lakes for 17 years, was tired. It's steel fatigued by countless battles with ice, storms, and the immense weight of its cargo. Here's the new theory, a chilling narrative pieced together from the shocking data that echoed up from the lake floor. As the Fitzgerald battled the 35-foot waves of the infamous Witch of November storm, its fate was being sealed not just by the furious water outside, but by a malevolent force within. The 26,000 tons of taconite pellets in its hold, which may have been partially saturated with water from previously damaged or improperly secured hatch covers and broken vents, began to shift. Thousands of tons of weight were sliding and slamming against the cargo holds with every monstrous wave the ship encountered rhythmically striking the bulkheads and hull with unimaginable power, amplifying the stress already being inflicted by the storm. The immense pressure of this shifting cargo, combined with the profound cyclical stress of being lifted to a wave's crest and then dropped sickeningly into its trough, put an unthinkable strain on the ship's already weakened keel. The microfractures began to connect, spreading like a spiderweb through the vessel's metallic spine. 
Then came the final horrifying moment. According to the compression damage mapped by the profilers, the ship didn't just break in half in a clean snap. The data suggests the keel failed catastrophically near the middle and the entire 729-foot vessel began to fold like a closing book. The weight in the center caused the ship to buckle downwards with incredible explosive force. For a split second, the bow and stern sections were likely pointing skyward as the ship's midsection collapsed inward, crushing parts of the superstructure and deckhouse as if they were made of tin. This violent inward folding action perfectly explains the mysterious inward facing damage that no other theory could adequately account for. The ship was then torn apart by the combined forces of gravity, the shifting cargo, and the violent churning water. To put it mildly, the ship self-destructed in a matter of seconds. The 29 men aboard, from the seasoned captain to the youngest deckhand, would have had no time to react, no time to even comprehend the cataclysm unfolding beneath their feet. People watching this might be wondering, could this have been prevented? Are we missing a key detail? The thing is, this new evidence points towards a tragedy that wasn't just about a monster storm, but also about the relentless wear and tear on a hardworking vessel pushed to its absolute limits. The data forces us to confront uncomfortable questions. Were the inspection standards of the time good enough to detect this kind of widespread metal fatigue hidden deep within the ship's structure? Was the Fitzgerald loaded in a way that made a catastrophic cargo shift more likely in extreme weather? These are the questions that the acoustic profiler data forces us to ask. The truth is, the legend of the Edmund Fitzgerald is no longer just a ghost story about the Witch of November. It's now a chilling engineering case study, a story of metal and water, of immense weight and catastrophic failure, all captured in the silent echoes from the bottom of the lake. It's a stark reminder that even the mightiest creations of steel can be brought down not just by nature's fury, but by the slow, invisible creep of decay from within. The new findings rewrite the final chapter of the Edmund Fitzgerald, but the 29 men are still at the bottom of Lake Superior. Does knowing the science behind the tragedy make it any less haunting? Let us know your thoughts below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more stories from the deep.